Okay? Oh boy, yes. Okay, so this makes the uh, momentum conservation manifest. <clears throat> but now we also want to make manifest that the sides of the polygon are null, right? And if you remember last time, to make momentum null, we could make that manifest with these spinner helicity variables, writing p is lambda lambda tilde, but then it wasn't obvious that the momentum add up to zero. So now what we're going to do is take everything that we've learned uh, from our discussion of twister space yesterday and now apply it to this picture, okay? So let's imagine, what does this polygon look like? So this is a picture in space time. Of course, it's not our space time, right? This is this funny space time in which the coordinates have units of momenta. Okay, so we, will call, we can call this the dual space time. Uh, it's a space time with coordinates of units of uh, momenta. But let's ask, what does this picture look like of the bunch of points null separated in the corresponding twister space? Okay, well, what does any point look like in twister space? A point, if you remember, looks like a line in twister space. So this is in space time, the dual space time. Now does it look like in the twister space? Now, this twister space, because it's associated with the space time and momentum space, is called momentum twister space. So momentum twister space. But let's say what it looks like. So that x1 is a line. There it is. So this is the line 1. X2 is another line. But it's not a random line because X2 is null separated from X1. So what does that mean about the second line? It intersects the first one, right? That's what null separation means. So the second line is another line. There it is, 2. But it has to intersect 1. Okay, so this is a line 2. The third one is a line 3, 4, 5. And so what we see is in twister space, in momentum twister space, this picture of the null polygon corresponds to a whole bunch of lines, one of which intersects the next. OK? OK, great. Now, how can I describe that picture? How can I give the data to totally specify that picture of a bunch of lines, one intersecting the next? I just give you the intersection points. <laughs> Yeah, and the last comes back and intersects the first. Yes, that's right. That's why we have a closed, a closed polygon, right? So all I have to do is, is hand you just the intersection points now. Now this is still in momentum twister space. I have to have to send z1 and some z2, z3, up to zn. And now I get to specify these z's completely freely, right? I just totally free, unconstrained bunch of data z's out of which I can build this line z1, z2, z2, z3, z3, z4, up to zn, z1. Okay. So the point xa is associated with the line, so the point in space-time, in this dual space-time, xa is associated with the line za, za plus 1 in momentum twister space. Okay. And then, so who is this edge then? Who is this null ray that corresponds to P1? That's the Zs directly. Right? So remember that the, that the lines in twister space are points in space time, and points in twister space are the null rays in space time, and that exactly corresponds to uh, the momenta. <coughs> so now, now we're done, because we've accomplished what, what we wanted. And now I just have to hand you a bunch of completely unconstrained data, z1 through zn. They're just beautiful four-dimensional vectors, um, totally unconstrained. And out of them, I can build a bunch of uh, null momenta that add up to zero. <laughs> Okay, which is exactly the data for the scattering process. Now let's just do it very explicitly. Remember I told you that if you have a ZA and a ZB in general, that the XAB associated with it is mu A lambda B minus, uh, uh, let's say I have a Z1 and a Z2. Okay, then the XAA dot is mu 1 lambda 2 minus mu 2 
lambda 1 over lambda 1, lambda 2, a dot a, a dot a. OK? So, so, so with this line z1, z2 is this point x, x1, 2 associated with that line. And so it's just a little exercise for you to work out what is the xa that's associated with these z's. So let me write each za as lambda a and some mu a in the, exactly the way that we were doing before. It's a four-dimensional vector. So, so exercise is you can work out what is xa um, associated with uh, za, za plus 1. And then after you work out xa, you can work out what is pa, which is xa plus 1 uh, minus xa, and, and verify that pa is null, which means that you can write the pa as lambda a, lambda tilde a, where the lambda is just the lambda that we see here, and there's an explicit formula for lambda tilde. And let me just give you what the answer is. Lambda tilde a turns out to be uh, mu a minus 1, sorry, lambda a minus 1, lambda a, mu a plus 1, plus cyclic. So plus a lambda a plus 1, lambda a minus 1, mu a, plus lambda a, lambda a, minus, uh, lambda a, lambda a plus 1, mu a minus 1, over lambda a minus 1, lambda a, lambda a, lambda a plus 1. OK, so it's a completely concrete formula now, right? You give me a bunch of, you give me, so give me z a, which is lambda a and mu a. And from here, I'm going to build a bunch of pa equals lambda a, lambda tilde a. The lambda a are just the lambdas here. The lambda tildes are given by this formula. And you can check. So it's clear that the p's squared is 0. And you can check that the sum of pa over a is equal to 0. So that's a beautiful exercise for you to see how that turns out with those little brackets there upstairs to the sum of pa is equal to 0. In order to show that, you need a small identity about these brackets, which is very simple to, uh, very simple to approve. Uh, if, if we have those lambdas, all these things are two-dimensional vectors. So if you have any two-dimensional vector, you can write it as a linear combination of two other two-dimensional vectors. right? And that simple fact is the following identity a, B, lambda C plus cyclic plus C, A, lambda B. So if I have some index here, plus, uh, plus B, C, lambda A is equal to 0. OK? Sorry, lambda A, A is equal to 0. You can verify that that's just the identity that tells you how do you expand a two-dimensional vector. So how do I expand a two-dimensional vector lambda a as a linear combination of lambda b and lambda c, which are two other two-dimensional vectors. Okay? So this identity many, has many names. It's also Kramer's rule. It has uh, many, many names. Um, uh, if you use that basic identity, uh, then it's a beautiful exercise to show directly that this uh, uh, definition for the lambda tilde satisfies momentum conservation. So after this journey into twister space and all these spinner helicity variables and so on, we're finally done. I can hand you completely unconstrained data, a bunch of four-dimensional vectors, and uh, from that I can uh, specify uh, the null momenta that correspond to a scattering process. Okay? Now, this problem of just the free particles, just the labeling of the free particles, is, of course, conformally invariant, right? Now, it's conformally invariant in this dual space. This is a different conformal symmetry than the conformal symmetry in ordinary space time. This is a funny conformal symmetry in this dual space where the coordinates have units of momenta. So it's called the dual conformal symmetry. And what we just talked about now is pure kinematics, right? It's just labeling massless, massless particles, free massless particles, nothing else. Uh, 
the data is nicely acted on by this dual conformal symmetry simply because conformal transformations preserve light rays. Okay. It's a big surprise and sort of miracle of the planar n equals 4 super Yang Nose theory that that dual conformal symmetry is actually a symmetry of the scattering amplitude. Uh, and it's associated with this picture uh, that the scattering amplitudes have a, which are amplitudes for gluons in the original space time, gluons scattering in the original space time, can be thought of in some appropriate sense as the expectation value of a Wilson loop in this space time. This Wilson loop with these null polygonal edges uh, in this, in this space-time. So because of that fact that there is this conformal symmetry in the actual answer, these variables have even more significance. They're not just beautiful variables that lets us talk about the external kinematical data in this free, unconstrained way. They're also the variables on which this hidden dual conformal symmetry acts as simply as possible. Okay, the dual conformal symmetry acts on the momentum twister variables just as 4 by 4 linear transformations, SL4, just as we talked about yesterday. Okay? All right. Now, one last bit of kinematics before we move on to a geometry uh, is this was all bosonic, and now I want to tell you how to think about the supersymmetry. And I'm going to be a little brief about this. Um, Partially because in the picture of the amplitohedron, uh, the supersymmetry is going to get completely bosonized. Okay, so um, uh, that's part of the beauty of the story. But uh, so, but anyway, let, but let me at least describe the variable so we know precisely what we're talking about. So, um, so now let's just talk about supersymmetry in scattering amplitudes. And here there's a lovely fact. So you all know that if you want to describe a theory using a Lagrangian, already if it has n equals 1 supersymmetry, you have to be smart, right? You have to be Wesson Zemino uh, to uh, figure out how to write down uh, supersymmetric Lagrangians. Um, and it should always make you suspicious in physics where you have to be smart. Um, you shouldn't have to be smart in physics. Physics is smart. Human beings aren't as smart as physics is. So every time human beings have to be smart, it's because there's something you haven't understood about the physics. The point of life in uh, theoretical physics especially is not to be clever and ingenious, is to be simple and deep. And, uh, and when you have to be too clever and ingenious, it means that you're not, you, you haven't understood the uh, picture simply and deeply enough. And supersymmetry is actually a perfect example of this because if someone hands you a Lagrangian, if someone hands you a free Lagrangian, okay, it's already uh, beautiful to realize that it has this amazing symmetry between bosons and fermions, but it's not so totally crazy. You have a free theory, okay, you can maybe discover a symmetry like that. But then at the interacting level, uh, you all know that there's something weird about supersymmetry. If someone hands you the component Lagrangian for the West Amino model, it's not obvious that it's supersymmetric. You have to go check these nonlinear variations of, uh, right, there are these nonlinear corrections of the super transformations. And then, of course, people teach you about superspace, and okay, then, it, then you sort of feel that it's all been made simple, but it's a little funny. You introduce all these auxiliary fields that aren't really there in order to, uh, in order to make the action of the supersymmetry uh, manifest. Um, and then, uh, so you see, supersymmetry is already not like other symmetries. If someone hands you a global U1 symmetry, <laughs> You know ahead of time, what does a global U1 symmetry mean? It's independent of what the theory is. You know what, what a global U1 symmetry does to a scalar field. You know what its variation is, independent of what the Lagrangian is. But supersymmetry is not like that. The symmetry depends on what the theory is, <laughs> depends on the Lagrangian. Okay? <laughs> and of course, it's stranger that when you have more and more supersymmetry, it's harder and harder to write down a Lagrangian that makes them manifest. Right? So there is this interesting tension between supersymmetry and locality. <laughs> And uh, with n equals 1 supersymmetry, we can have Lagrangians with some work we have to learn about in courses. n equals 2, you have to be crazier and more Russian in order to learn how to uh, build these harmonic superspaces. You know, uh, and, uh, and n equals 4, there's no Lagrangian, right? There's, so, uh, which is manifestly supersymmetric. How weird is that? That the more beautiful the, the theory becomes, the harder it is to make the symmetry manifest at the level of the Lagrangian. Um, so, again, this is one of many hints that there's something wrong with, with Lagrangians. Uh, but what I want to stress is that the story is diametrically opposite on shell. 
Because when you're talking about what supersymmetry does to physical particles, you know exactly what it does, right? You don't have to be smart. You don't have to be clever. You know exactly what it does to the on-shell particles. It takes a gluon and it converts it to a gluino. Okay, so the, act the action of supersymmetry on the on-shell states is totally manifest. And that's why we can, it, when we have maximal supersymmetry, in fact, it, it makes your life, when we write down amplitudes, as simple as possible. Okay, unlike with the Lagrangian, where it makes your life impossibly complicated. Okay. <coughs> so let's actually jump immediately to theories with maximal supersymmetry. So we're talking about uh, uh, n equals 4 in uh, four dimensions. And we know we have the SUSY algebra. And, and this is going to be some p alpha alpha dot uh, delta ij. Okay? So i runs from i runs from 1 to 4 for the four uh, supersymmetries. And up to now, we were labeling our scattering amplitudes for gluons, let's say, by their helicities, pluses and minuses, right? And that's slightly ugly. It has this funny discrete label on it. So if you want to talk about n particles, you have two to the n different scattering amplitudes for all the different choices of pluses and minus for any given leg. But when we have an extra symmetry, we should diagonalize the symmetries as much as we possibly can, right? So it's not a good idea to label the states by the helicities. Now, now what do we have? What is the particle content we have? We have, a, we have a positive helicity gluon. We have one positive helicity gluon, say. We have, we have uh, four positive helicity. Uh, we have four uh, helicity plus a half fermions. We have six scalars with zero helicity. We have four. Uh, uh, fermions of helicity minus a half, and we have one gluon of helicity minus one. And I'll explain why I'm using these indices on them for a second. Okay, well, wh why am I using these indices? Because I can build all these states starting from one of them and applying the cues. <laughs> okay, I have four cues, so I, I use this, and I apply, <coughs> I apply, maybe I should have put this downstairs and upstairs, doesn't really matter. I apply the cues, and I build these guys. And I apply them uh, twice, and I build those. Three times, I build those. Four times, I build those. And they're anti-symmetric in these R-symmetry indices. Okay? So this is the spectrum of states uh, that I have. <coughs> but then why should I label them by these helicity states? That's dumb. right? I should find some linear combination of them that's acted on as nicely as possible by supersymmetry. <laughs> In other words, I should try to diagonalize as many of the symmetries as I can. That's why we label the uh, states by momenta, because we're diagonalizing translations. So let's try to also diagonalize the cues as much as we can. We can't diagonalize both because they anti-commute, so I can choose to diagonalize one of them. And I'm going to choose to, uh, I'm going to, choose to diagonalize Q tilde. Okay? So we're going to say Q tilde alpha dot j on some state, and it's going to be a Grassmann coherent state, okay, so, so these eta tilde is going to be a Grassmann variable, and this is going to be eta tilde j, and what's going to, so this is a state that's labeled by its momentum, which is a lambda and lambda tilde, and some Grassmann variables, eta tilde, and so this state is going to satisfy that q on, lambda, q on the state is eta tilde lambda tilde back on the state. So these are the nicest possible states that we can use. And, uh, and concretely, that's just a particular linear combination of all these states. Okay, which linear combination? This state eta tilde is just e to the, is, uh, is roughly e to the eta tilde q on, uh, on, let's say, plus. Okay, so this would be, concretely, it would be plus, plus eta tilde i, plus a half i, plus 1 over 2 factorial, eta tilde i, eta tilde j, 0 ij, plus 1 over 3 factorial, eta tilde i, eta tilde j, eta tilde k, uh, minus a half, plus 1 over 4 factorial, eta tilde, I'll just abbreviate to the fourth, minus 1. OK? Eta uh, ij kl, ij kl. All right, so it's just this particular linear combination of all of the helicity states. So that's the good way to label 
uh, the external data when we have supersymmetry. And so what we're left with in the end is a very beautiful object. You see, when we have the actual helicities, even though we stripped off these color factors and the momenta have this cyclic structure acting on them, uh, when we stripped off the color factors, the actual amplitudes aren't cyclically invariant because the choice of helicities breaks the symmetry between the different particles. But now when I label all the states by these Grassmann coherent states, then the cyclic symmetry is manifest on everybody. So the super amplitude, this is a super amplitude, is just a function of lambda, lambda tilde, and eta tilde, which is completely uh, cyclically invariant. And you can actually show that, uh, that the correct weight under all the helicities means that if you rescale these by T and T inverse and the eta tilde, the tilde is there to remind you that it's like a lambda tilde as far as its scaling goes. So if you scale this by T A inverse, that you should just pick up a factor T A to the minus two times M of lambda, lambda tilde, and eta tilde. Okay? And so these super amplitudes are functions of the lambda and the lambda tilde, and they're polynomials in eta tilde. Right, they're Grassmann variables, they're polynomials in eta tilde. <laughs> and so because they're polynomials in eta tilde, we can expand them as a sum uh, of something I'll call, if it's for n particles, m of n and k hat of lambda and lambda tilde and eta tilde where this guy has four k hat eta tildes in it. Okay? So it's a polynomial in the eta tildes. There's a piece with no eta tildes, four eta tildes, eight eta tildes, four k eta tildes in general. Why is it a multiple of four? Because there's this R symmetry index acting on the eta tildes, and so everything has got to be uh, contracted with the R symmetry uh, epsilon symbol. And so they come in fours. The eta tildes come in fours. All right. So <coughs> now I've introduced this uh, variable k hat. A little exercise you can do is, uh, it, so it's just literally polynomial. So if you expand it out in the eta tildes, it'll have a piece that has like eta tilde to the one to the fourth, eta tilde three to the fourth, and then multiplied by something. And then a piece eta one, eta two, eta five, eta seven, <laughs> times something else, and so on. And the component amplitudes you just pick off by, uh, by, by those coefficients. Okay? So for example, if you want an amplitude with two gluons being uh, particle one and particle five having negative helicity and everyone else having positive helicity, what do you do? To pick out the one with positive helicity, you put the eta tilde for those particles to zero. So eta tilde for everyone to zero, except for particle one and particle five. You want them to have negative helicity, so you extract a piece of the super amplitude that looks like eta tilde one to the fourth, eta tilde five to the fourth. Okay? And just that component of the super amplitude is the corresponding physical helicity amplitude. Okay? So, uh, so there's no magic for how you extract. This is just a packaging. It's just a generating function to combine all of the helicity amplitudes into one object under which supersymmetry acts nicely. And in fact, this k hat corresponds, the, the component amplitudes in this piece of the super amplitude is the one that would correspond to k hat negative helicity gluons. OK. So but now there's a very uh, nice, there's a very nice thing. Be, uh, because momentum is conserved, there's a delta function for momentum conservation. And similarly, there's a super partner for the delta function of momentum conservation that we always have to have because of the supersymmetry. Okay? So that means that just like normally when we write an amplitude, we pull off a delta function for momentum conservation that would just be lambda, lambda, tilde. There's also an analog of that, which is this guy. 
Okay, so that's, that's the super analog of uh, momentum conservation. And, uh, and one very quick way of seeing that that corresponds to a supersymmetry is that half of the supersymmetries correspond to translations of eta tilde, okay? And they correspond to translations of eta tilde by something proportional to lambda tilde, okay? So that supersymmetry is a translation in superspace. And the half of the supersymmetries that we're making manifest are just the translations. Eta tilde goes to eta tilde plus something times lambda tilde. And so under that variation, uh, because the sum of lambda lambda tilde is zero, that delta function is uh, invariant, okay? So that's the super partner of momentum conservation. So you see from here, this thing already has eight eta tildes in it. So you see without doing anything that every amplitude has to have at least k hat equals two, okay? Because we have to have these, uh, these, these guys in it. Now, we're, I'm gonna pull out a factor here which is just lambda one, lambda two. Well, let me just write it right as one, two, two, three, up to n one. And what does that do? Well, once I have that factor, this takes into account all these weights. Every particle appears downstairs twice, so everything has perfectly good weights. And so what's left is a function of, well, it's still a function of lambda, lambda tilde, and eta tilde except now this has 4k eta tildes in it, where k is equal to k hat minus two, okay? Okay, now, this thing out in front has a beautiful interpretation and meaning. This is the famous Park-Taylor amplitude that I told you, told you about. And in fact, if you have an amplitude just for negative helicity gluons, well, two negative helicity gluons and everyone else positive helicity, um, or if we want the sector that has k equals zero, or k hat equals two, k equals zero, that expression amazingly turns out to be the exact tree scattering amplitude, <laughs> okay? So hundreds of pages of Feynman diagrams actually collapse to that single beautiful simple term that, as I told you yesterday, was written down exactly 30 years ago yesterday, <laughs> okay? So, uh, so that's, uh, that's already amazing that, that, that all the tree amplitudes for any n with, uh, with, uh, with k hat equals zero or in components with two negative helicity gluons is equal to uh, that guy. It's so important to us now that we take it out. It's like almost part, it's almost kinematical now. It's like the delta function for momentum conservation. It all comes out, <laughs> okay? This thing which is left over, uh, let me call this uh, R for left over, remainder, okay? Uh, this thing which is left over, now it has weight zero, weight zero under rescaling, under lambda, lambda tilde, under, well, it has weight zero under lambda goes to T lambda, et cetera. And so that's the guy that we're going to be uh, interested in uh, computing. But now here's the wonderful surprise. So I told you that, uh, so we, we, we talked a moment ago about how to express the lambdas and lambda tildes in terms of these momentum twister variables, right? That makes the momentum conservation manifest, and that's fine now because everything is making sense on the support of this delta function for momentum conservation. <clears throat> it turns out that, that, that just like I wrote down, so we have a, a z, which is lambda and mu. Now we can extend this to a super z, some curly super z, which is lambda, mu, and then underneath there's a bunch of Grassmann variables, eta. Okay, there's, there are four of these, and there's four of these. And the relation between a to tilde, so just like we had lambda tilde is a minus one a mu a plus one plus dot dot over a minus one a, a a plus one. Similarly, we have that a to tilde is a minus one a little a, uh, a to plus one plus cyclic over a minus one a a, a plus one. Okay, and if we do that, the super momentum conservation is made obvious, just like ordinary momentum conservation was made obvious by the other variables. 
But the amazing upshot is that, so this function, r, can be written of lambda, lambda tilde, and eta tilde, can be written as a function of these super z variables, z a, okay, which is invariant under just invariant zero weight under the z a goes to t a z a, even supersymmetrically. So that's just that's just the fact that we're using these variables to express. Uh, uh, these are the good variables, right? Uh, as we said, unconstrained variables, which give us the external kinematical data, now also even supersymmetrically. But the amazing fact, uh, the non-kinematical fact, is that R is actually invariant under a dual superconformal symmetry. which is SL4 slash 4 acting as uh, uh, linear transformations on these super Z. Okay? All right, so that's this famous hidden dual conformal symmetry of the n equals 4 scattering amplitudes. Okay, but now, now we're done. So, uh, so this is the, we've set up the problem. What we'd like to do is understand how do we compute this function? How do we compute R? And um, of course, we can compute it with Feynman diagrams in principle. And if we do it, we get all the horrendously complicated mess. Um, but we'd like to know, uh, is there a different starting point for computing them? And, and can we understand uh, from this different starting point why the final answer looks like it comes from local evolution in space-time and all the other things that we talked about before. Okay, now, this would be an entire lecture series by itself to tell you the methods that have been developed to learn to calculate these scattering amplitudes without Feynman diagrams. And um, these go under the names of uh, various recursion relations, BCFW recursion relations, uh, lots of other interesting ideas. And to, to actually explain how they work, as I said, would be a whole lecture series in itself. Uh, but let me tell you philosophically how it works, is that uh, instead of using Feynman diagram to do the calculation that, of course, makes it manifest every step of the way that the answers you get are local and unitary, what you do is you, you use the fact that the answer is local and unitary to make an ansatz uh, for the answer and then use a locality and unitarity to determine it. So you're exploiting locality and unitarity to determine the structure of the answer. For example, what happens, let me just very quickly sketch it, what happens for a BCFW recursion is you say, let's say you have an amplitude, and <laughs> something that you know about the amplitude is that if you take if some subset of the momenta add up to be on shell, then the amplitude has to have a pole and has to factorize on the pole. So let's say the momenta P1 plus P2 plus P3 go on shell. So if P1 plus P2 plus P3 squared goes to zero, then this amplitude has got to factorize. It has to go like one over P1 plus P2 plus P3 squared times a little four particle amplitude on the left and a four particle amplitude on the right with one, two, three, four, five, six, and some intermediate line, which is going on shell. And you have to sum over all the helicities of whatever the particles are, h and negative h, that can run through the loop, right? So as I said, uh, if you compute Feynman diagrams, this is just obvious, because that's what the diagrams are doing, right? You're summing over all, but you have these virtual things going on in the middle. Virtual particles going in the middle. But it's clear that if you go on shell, those virtual particles become real. And the whole apparatus of having the gauge redundancy and all the rest of it then guarantees that this happens. So that's the purpose in life of the usual formalism to make this factorization property manifest. And that's also how you can check. If someone said, I did the calculation, you can check if they're lying or not by whether this factorization happens. 
So but conversely, this can awakens you to the possibility that maybe you can forget about uh, that prescription and just find a way to present an answer that makes that fact manifest, right? What, what you can do as an intermediate, though, is use this fact to determine the amplitude in a different way. This is a little bit like what you're familiar with with functions of a single complex variable. When you have functions of one variable and you know what all the poles are and the residues at the poles, then using Cauchy's theorem, you can just determine what the function is everywhere. Okay? So here we know, now it looks superficially a lot more complicated because we have a function of many, many variables. And in this multidimensional space, we, we know where the poles are and how has to factorize on the poles. But the beautiful idea of BC, F, and W, Brito, Cachazo, Fang, and Witten, was to explore this multidimensional space just in one-dimensional directions. Okay? So what you do, you see, generically, if I hand you this thing, of course, these momenta are not on shell, right? But all you do is you take two of the particles, let's say three and four. You take P3 and P4, and you deform them. You add P3 plus a Z times some momentum Q, and then you have to take that momentum Q away from somewhere, so you take it away from the next guy, right? You choose Q so that things, everything is null. So you choose Q such that uh, Q squared is equal to zero, and Q dot P3 and P4 is equal to zero. Right? And so now what you have is a function of just z. Of all the other momenta and a function of z. But now as you move around in z, somewhere in the z plane, you're going to expose all of these singularities, all these poles. Right? As you, as you change z, then somewhere you'll put these intermediate particles on shell. So as a function of this single variable, z, you have a bunch of poles. But the poles correspond, each pole course precisely corresponds. You know what the residue is. It precisely corresponds to the factorization of the amplitude to uh, lower pieces. A crucial thing is to be able to control the pole at infinity. Um, and that's where the real miracle happens, that, that there are no poles at infinity. That's not at all obvious from, from Feynman diagrams. If you draw them, you would naively think that things blow up at infinity, you have problems at infinity. But, it, but uh, quite remarkably, there are no poles at infinity. So you can completely reconstruct what the object looks like just from the knowledge of these poles at finite locations that just correspond to lower amplitudes on factorization channels. And so in this way, you can build a higher amplitude by gluing together lower amplitudes. And I want to stress how important that is. It's not like Feynman diagrams where you have these virtual particles in the middle. There's no virtual particles in this picture. You take on-shell lower point amplitudes and you smash them together in a way that keeps everything on shell and you build higher amplitudes in this way. Okay? So that's the basic idea of the BCFW recursion. And using this method, you can take any higher tree amplitude and compute it recursively in terms of lower ones that you've computed already. All the way down to three particle amplitudes. And the three particle amplitude is something that turns out to be completely determined by symmetries, by Poincare symmetry. Okay? So you don't even have to think. Uh, a structure is just nailed. So everything is just beautifully built up in this way. But uh, as I said, many lectures to explain how that works uh, properly, but that's the, that's the spirit. But something I want you to see from, the, from here is that uh, in this way of writing, in this way of doing the calculation, you're first of all, it's highly non-unique. There's millions of ways of doing this recursion. Who do you choose to, to deform? And you can make different choices as you recurse down. Okay? So it's, you never get the answer in a unique form. Another remarkable feature of the answer is that each term in the answer, each term, uh, uh, cannot correspond to a local scattering process in spacetime. And the reason is that each term has poles that, does not, that don't look like just a sum of a subset of the momenta. That's because each term is what you get from taking lower point amplitudes glued together, which do have poles there, but then you shift and you deform away from them. Okay? So each term has some good poles that correspond to local uh, space-time processes and some spurious bad poles that can't possibly correspond to local processes in space-time. Okay? And only the sum over all these collection of objects is free of those spurious poles and gives you the right answer. 
So these were all very evocative of some kind of uh, picture. You know, and then when, 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 when you study these individual building blocks more, the individual BCFW terms, you start discovering they have all sorts of connections. Well, they have all sorts of remarkable properties that satisfy lots of highly non-trivial identities between each other. Each term by itself turns out to be, uh, you see, in this picture, I've only talked about ordinary momenta. I didn't tell you anything about the dual space, dual conformal symmetry. We just went all the way back to ordinary amplitudes. But each one of these terms, when you finally do the recursion all the way to the end, you get a sum of a bunch of terms. Each one of the terms by themselves turn out to be invariant under the dual conformal symmetry. <laughs> okay? Each term sees the full infinite dimensional symmetry of the theory. There's an infinite dimensional symmetry. There's the dual conformal symmetry, which was hidden. There's the obvious conformal symmetry in the usual space time, which is manifest. And those two symmetries together commute to an infinite dimensional symmetry algebra known as the Yangian of SL4, or SL4 slash 4. This is a hidden infinite dimensional symmetry of planar n equals 4 super Yang mills. But each term of the BCFW recursion has it, term by term. Okay, so there's something obviously important about these building blocks. They know about all the symmetries, conformal symmetry, dual conformal symmetry. They don't care much about locality and space time, because they're not. They're a piece by piece of spurious poles. The amplitude wants to be built out of them, but in not a unique way. You can do it in lots and lots of different ways to get the final answer. They have spurious pieces that cancel miraculously amongst them to get the final answer. What's going on? Okay, so what's the, what's the structure which is controlling this? In other words, of course, one answer is, well, you just derived it from quantum field theory, stupid. And so that's, that's what it is. But it had a very strong sense that these objects were associated with another world of ideas, another set of structures, with their own logic for why they were being put together in, 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 in this particular way. And uh, that's the story of positive geometry, the positive Grassmannian, and the amplitohedron that I want to tell you uh, about in, in, in the rest of the lectures. But yes? Well, for, for, for tree amplitudes, it doesn't matter so much, because they, uh, you, you, you color order all of them, and everything is, is uh, there are no multi-trace pieces there. Okay? So, uh, but, but at loop level, it matters. So at loop level, it, you can extend these recursion ideas also to loop level, then there, there the planarity matters a lot. OK, <laughs> okay. yes? Yes, well, uh, many of these things are true for gravity as well. Uh, um, but maybe I'll make some comments about gravity at the end of the uh, lectures. Okay, so, um, yeah, uh, these things about tree amplitudes are very universal. They're also true for gravity. And they have exactly the same flavor, okay, that you have pieces that are built out of on-shell objects. They have spurious poles. They cancel miraculously some. All these things are, are very sort of universally true. Um, it's in the context of planar n equals 4 that we've taken the story sort of as far as we can to the direction of finding the second starting point that it all, that it all comes from. But just, just to give you a flavor, let me tell you what the amplitudes look like, the simplest amplitudes. With has k hat equals 3 or k equals 1. Okay, well, the very simplest one, well, the very simplest the very simplest are k hat equals 2 and k equals 0. And at tree level, this function r that I just talked about before is just 1. Okay? So, and that's what I just told you, that the tree amplitude for, for k hat equals 2 is this famous Park-Taylor amplitude that we just factored out. Okay? So that's, that's the absolute simplest case. It's just been factored out to be 1. So the next simplest case has would have that k hat equals 3, so with 3 negative helicity gluons, and k equals 1, again, tree level. And these are called the, so these are called MHV amplitudes, maximally helicity violating for obscure historical reasons. And these and imaginatively are next to maximally helicity violating, it's NMHV. OK, now there's a much more interesting formula for R that you can get from BCFW recursion relations. Okay. And now I'm going to write it, uh, and, and there's, as I told you, it's not unique at all. You can get it in many, many different ways. Um, uh, but let me give you one particular way of doing it recursively. And this is going to be a function of these super momentum twister variables, as I told you. And you just have to take it on faith, but this is what it looks like. It looks like the sum of a bunch of objects, 1i i plus 1. 
1, i, i plus 1, j, j plus 1. Sum over i and j. These are particle labels between 1 and n. All right, so what is this funny brackety object? Well, this is what it is explicitly. So in general, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, for any five labels, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 is the following. So just, uh, I'll explain all these things in a second. Bracket one, two, three, four, uh, A to five plus cyclic divided by one, two, three, four, two, three, four, five, up to five, one, two, three. Okay. Now, these etas are the Grassmann variables that we're talking about, and this delta four is in the sense of delta functions for Grassmann variables. So it's really the fourth power of this, of this, uh, of that, uh, uh, object in the Grassmann variables, okay? So in the sense of delta of eta is equal to eta, right? So, uh, but what are these brackets? Well, remember, uh, the only symmetry that I have is SL4, SL4 slash 4, but there's the bosonic part of SL4, it's just Z goes to any 4 by 4 linear transformation times Z, okay? So ZI goes to LIJ, ZJ, and so that means the only symmetric tensor that I have is the epsilon symbol, epsilon IJKL. And so the only invariants that I can build are things like ZA, ZB, ZC, ZD, and this bracket is just defined to be epsilon IJKL times all the Zs contracted together, okay? So those are the only invariants that can ever appear, are these four brackets. And every time in the rest of these, this uh, lecture, in the next, I have an object in brackets, it means it's contracted to the epsilon symbol, because we don't have any metrics. All we have is the epsilon symbol in this entire story. Okay, very good. So, it's a very simple object. Now, let's just talk a little bit about the kind of poles that we expect are going to appear in our, in our answer. Um, because, as we said, the only poles we expect to appear are when for tree amplitudes, or when a sum of, of a subset of the momenta, let's say from PA all the way up to PB, go on shell. So when I have PA plus up to PB squared goes to zero is the only time I expect to find poles. And in this picture of the polygon, of the light-like polygon, this just means if this is PA, if this is uh, PA, and this all the way up to PB, this just corresponds to, this is xA, and that's xB plus 1. The sum of all these p's is just, the sum of all these p's is just xB plus 1 minus xA. And so we expect to have a pole when xB plus 1 minus xA squared is going to 0. Okay, when the corners of this polygon become not separated from each other. All right, maybe I should have put a p b minus 1 here, so that this is xb minus xa squared goes to 0, okay? And what does that correspond to in this twister space? What does it correspond to when two points become null separated? Well, this means that the line zb, zb plus 1 has got to intersect the line za, za plus 1. And so that pole means that we should have, uh, we should have poles when zb, zb plus 1 ZA, ZA plus 1 goes to 0. When that 4 bracket goes to 0, it means that those 4 Zs are linearly independent, so they all lie in a plane, and therefore those lines intersect each other. Okay? So ahead of time, we know. So we, so we know, so we know that the only poles of the amplitude should correspond to, let me write it as zi, zi plus 1, zj, zj plus 1 goes to 0. So somehow, even though the amplitude is given as a function of these z's, 
It should care about these funny i, I plus one, jj plus one combinations, right? That's how it starts knowing that it has something to do with the, with the space time. That, uh, that despite the fact that in twister space things are functions of points, that it cares about the lines too, right? It cares about these consecutive lines and it cares about when the consecutive lines intersect each other uh, in order to find uh, singularities in the right spot, okay? So, but now let's look at this answer and see how many of these things are obvious in the answer. Well, first, I hope you see, it's an incredibly simple, we just wrote it down on one line. This would be thousands of pages of Feynman diagrams, okay, got collapsed to this uh, uh, single simple expression. Um, but it has many funny features. First of all, the final answer is supposed to be psychically invariant when you cycle all the labels over by one. But it isn't manifestly so, because particle one is special. I pick out particle one. Okay, so one I plus one, not obviously cyclically invariant. Next, is it obviously local? Locality means that the only poles are when I plus one, JJ plus one goes to zero. But it is not that either. If I look at the, uh, the poles here from that expression, the, 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 the denominator of the expression has pieces that look like, for example, one I, I plus one J. Then the next one, I, I plus one, J, J plus one. Okay, this one is good. But then there's a bunch of other ones, three other ones, um, which, are, uh, which are, you know, one, I plus one, J, J plus one. And then the other two. So this is bad. This is not a physical pole in general. That's not a physical pole. It has five poles, four of which are spurious. They're not physical. They're not local, but only one of which is physical. Okay. So this little example already shows you, this little example already shows you the kind of structure that we get when we, uh, uh, when we, uh, when we stare at these nice representations of amplitudes uh, that I alluded to. They're not given in a unique way, right? They're given by breaking some of the symmetries. There's many different ways you can do it. The pieces are incredibly simple, but the pieces don't, aren't manifestly local, okay? They have these spurious poles, which amazingly cancel in the sum. Now, in order for it to be true that all these things happen, these little objects have to satisfy identities. And in fact, there's a, there's a, there's a, a remarkable sort of six-term identity that these five brackets satisfy, that, which you can use to prove all these things, okay? For instance, if you could prove that this object is cyclically invariant, that would immediately tell you that it's free of these spurious poles, because what the poles are depend on one here, and so if, if, uh, if when you cycled everything over, one turned into two, then the location of those spurious poles would change. <laughs> but so if the final answer is cyclically invariant, then it has to be free of those spurious poles. Um, uh, but the identity that tells you this is cyclically invariant turns out to be some very simple, but sort of quite non-trivial to verify, six-term identity involving uh, these basic brackets. Okay? All right, so now what we're going to do in the third lecture, but before uh, I get to the third lecture, I want to just do a tiny bit of, uh, a tiny bit of uh, projective geometry uh, review. But what we're going to do in the next lecture is explain where this comes from, okay? And just, just to give you a highlight, we're going to see that this, this answer is actually the volume of some geometric object, okay? It's the amplitude, but if you never knew, knew about the amplitude, we're going to associate, you give me the external momentum twister data, extend it in some specific way, but you give me the data, and from that data, I'm going to construct a certain geometric object that lives, doesn't live in, even live in twister space, it lives in a slightly more abstract space, okay? And the volume of that object is going to be the scattering amplitude. <laughs> But in order to compute the volume, if we've never heard of the scattering amplitudes, we just want to calculate the volume of this object, you want to break it up into little pieces. You want to, in this case, it's a, it's a polyhedral object. It's literally a polytope. So you want to break it up into simplices, the same way that if you want to calculate the area of a polygon, you'd break it up into triangles. Okay? If you study the object, you discover there's a certain set of simplices that fit into it in a nice way, which are labeled by 1, i, i plus 1, j, j plus 1. Okay? And though they just fit into the object, and when you compute the volumes, it's exactly this formula. Okay? So, uh, and the fact that the answer doesn't depend on, uh, on, the, on the way you do the recursion is simply that you can triangulate this one underlying object in many ways. 
right? So that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, and that's the beginning of the story of the uh, amplitude. OK, but before getting there, uh, I just want to spend the last uh, few minutes here <laughs> just giving you a very simple crash course on some aspects of projective geometry. Actually, these aren't going to be super critical uh, for the necessarily brief exposition I have to give you. Um, but just to make you a little bit more familiar, because it's extremely, extremely simple, but um, it's sort of ironic that we are more familiar with much fancier geometries. You know, we're more familiar with Euclidean geometry, Riemannian geometry. These are much, much fancier geometries than projective geometry, which has almost no structure in it. Um, and these fancier geometries were understood in the 1800s, while projective geometry was understood in the 1500s when people were trying to learn how to draw in perspective. Okay? So uh, if you look at really old drawings, people sucked at drawing things. And, and they, they, they didn't look like the world you see. Okay? They didn't, uh, uh, and then people had the great idea, what if I just draw what I see, literally? right? So you, you imagine uh, everywhere you see a light ray comes into your eye, you just draw what you see there, and so on. And that gives you a picture. And depending on the plane that you project all those light rays coming into your eye, you get a different picture, and you can draw from perspective in different directions. And that's the beginning of the idea that you should think of the geometry as a bunch of rays passing through an, an, an origin. Uh, and that's, that's exactly what the projective geometry is. So people like Desargues and others in the 1500s uh, partially motivated by trying to learn how to draw more nicely uh, described uh, projective geometry. But just a few concepts, uh, just a, a little bit of uh, projective geometry 001. Okay. So let's, uh, let's first imagine that we want to, uh, uh, that, that we, that the basic point is that anything you do in geometry, any, uh, any plane, any geometric questions that don't involve distance are best thought of projectively. And again, the idea, let's say I'm talking about P2. I want to think of the space of all lines that go through the, or, uh, the space of all lines that pass through uh, an origin in a three-dimensional space that if I intersect with some plane, give me a bunch of points in two dimensions. Okay? So, uh, so this would be the example of the two-dimensional uh, projective space. But what does it mean? Algebraically, concretely, it means that uh, I can imagine that I have a bunch of z's. Let's say, in this case, three-dimensional z's, if I'm doing plane geometry, zi that are identified with t times zi. Then in practice, it means that, uh, as we said yesterday, if I have a z0 at the top and a z1 and a z2, then I can always rescale the top to 1 and then the rest of the variables I can call, let's say, x1 and x2. And these will be, again, just points, just points in the plane. Okay? X, x1, x2, and so on. Okay? But why is this useful? Um, it's useful because it allows us to unify in one way all possible, uh, all possible linear structures we can have on the plane. And in particular, uh, it allows us to say that any two lines intersect. Okay? Any two lines intersect. They might have an intersection point at infinity uh, because in, that's the central novelty of projective geometry is just that we add all the points at infinity are added to our, are, are added to our plane. And accessing the points at infinity just corresponds to, cho to choosing uh, the, the, the pieces of this uh, three-dimensional space that are not accessible 
uh, and these coordinates are where z0 is equal to 0, but that's just another, another chart which you have to use to cover the other parts of the uh, projective space. But, um, but what I just want to spend five minutes doing is showing you how practical and useful it is. Okay? Even if you forget about all the twisters and amplitude and things like this, whenever you're doing any problems uh, where you have to solve simple geometric problems on the plane or in three dimensions, it's much better to think about them projectively and solve the problems projectively. Let, let me give you some examples of this. So um, see, uh, the, a very important point here is that there is a, there is an SL3 symmetry. There's an SL3 symmetry that acts on these Zs, right? And that SL3 symmetry is the largest symmetry there is that maps straight lines into straight lines. Okay, so this is the, the crucial point. If someone just, if we went the other way around, if someone just handed you a bunch of points on the plane, just a two-dimensional plane, and, and asked you, what are all the symmetries that are that map straight lines into straight lines? Then you would naively think, well, there's translations, and there's two-by-two two linear transformations. And those are all the symmetries that map straight lines into straight lines. But it's true, those do map straight lines into straight lines, but they have the additional feature that they map parallel lines into parallel lines. Okay, And if you actually you know, just do the responsible exercise of the most general variation you can allow and just ask it to preserve straight lines, you discover there's a larger symmetry than SL2 cross-translations. There's an SL3 symmetry, which maps straight lines into straight lines. But it has the feature that it doesn't map parallel lines into parallel lines. It'll take parallel lines and map them into lines that, uh, that uh, intersect. So this SL3 symmetry is a little bit hidden. Okay, it's a little bit hidden symmetry of the plane, that, uh, that, uh, uh, which is the biggest symmetry there is that maps straight lines into straight lines. And you make that hidden SL3 manifest by thinking projectively, thinking of these things as the points in your two-dimensional space as, as secretly lines through the origin in a three-dimensional space with this SL3 symmetry acting on them. <clears throat> uh, the, uh, uh, in order to go from this big projective space to, uh, to, the, to the affine space, you have to specify some line at infinity. Well, well never mind. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it in a second. Okay. All right. So, uh, so the SL3 symmetry is very, is very, very important. And it also means that the only invariant tensor that we have, let's say, is just epsilon ijk. Nothing else. Okay? So there's no distances. There's no metrics. The only thing we can imagine using in this whole business is the, is the uh, 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 epsilon symbol. But let me just give you some, just a few minutes, just some concrete examples uh, for why this is useful. So, um, so we talked about what points are. Now, what is an equation for a straight line? A straight line, you know, if you're in junior high school, a straight line you say is ax plus by plus c equals zero, right? That's a nice equation for a, for a straight line. Um, and so always when you do these things, you're the pieces that, you, that have the x and the y, and then there's some constant pieces left over, right? Now, this equation that, that defines a straight line has a very nice projective interpretation. If I now introduce z to be 1xy, and some, this has a lower index, and a wi, which has an upper index, to be uh, cab, then you see that this equation is just wi zi equals 0. Okay. So everything with these constants can secretly be thought of as something that was projective, and you just uh, rescaled the, 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 the top component of the, of the vector to be 1. All right. So this is the equation for a straight line. In other words, if the w's are fixed, all the z's that satisfy this equation line a straight line. So what specifies the line is a, if the z's are points with indices downstairs, a line is a point with the index upstairs under the SL3 transformations, OK? All right, now, so far so good. Now, now let's just do a few little exercises so you see why this is so useful. Let's say I give you two points. Here's a, here's a point with coordinates x1, y1. Again, just normally in the plane, and x2, y2. 
and you want to know what is the line connecting them? What is the equation for the line connecting them? Okay, well, this is simple. We know how to find the equation for the line connecting them, but how would we think of it projectively? Well, what do I need to do projectively? Projectively, I have some Z1i and a Z2i. Now, what does it mean? What does it mean uh, to build a line? I want to have a, an object which has an upstairs index. Sorry, these were downstairs. I want to build, I want to build a W with an upstairs index which satisfies that W, Z1, is equal to 0, and W, Z2, is equal to 0. Okay? So what, how can I build an object with one upstairs index out of something with two downstairs indices? I use the epsilon symbol. Right? So WI is just epsilon IJK, Z1, J, Z2, K. And it just practically tells you exactly what the line is. Right? And believe me, if it, you know, these things are trivial, but it's much easier to do it like this than to stare and draw a slope and an intercept, especially if you go to a three or four dimensions. Uh, well, it's, it's exactly the same. If you want the, in three dimensions, you want the plane containing three points, it's just epsilon i, j, k, l, z1 i, z1 j, z2 k, z3 l, and so on. Okay? Okay, let's go backwards. What if someone hands you two lines? Here's a line W1, and here's a line W2, and they intersect at a point. How do I find the intersection point? Well, it's exactly the same. Okay? The, the, the uh, intersection point for 1, 2 would just be downstairs, would be epsilon ijk, w1j, w2k, upstairs. Okay? And you also see that there's an obvious symmetry between lines and points. Okay, and in general, between planes and points. Planes would be an object in, uh, in a higher dimensional space. Uh, let's say in three dimensional space would be P3, P4. Points would be things with downstairs indices. One downstairs index, a plane would be something with an, an upstairs index. Okay? And so obviously you can switch points and planes and everything, uh, everything works, works fine. Uh, I'll just say one last thing before I stop, just so you really see how cool and useful these uh, ideas are. This was, again, as I said, just all meant to familiarize you a little bit more. Uh, so um, this is one that I'll use. I'll, I'll do just two more things. One that I'll use in a moment in the next lecture. Let's say that I want to, I have a triangle, Z1, Z2, whose corners are Z1, Z2, and Z3. And I want to talk about what are the, some point on the inside of the triangle. And let's say this point had a mass, I'll call the mass C1. This had mass C2 and mass C3. Okay, I'm using C for a funny reason. Uh, but uh, anyway, normally I'd write the center of mass here as something like C1, Z1, plus C2, Z2, plus C3, Z3, over C1 plus C2 plus C3, right? So when we do these, uh, there, there are these one over the sum of the masses. But what is this as a projective statement? As a projective statement, it's that yi is just c1, z1, plus c2, z2, plus c3, z3. And I don't have to divide by c1 plus c2 plus c3, because that's taken care of by the projectivization, right? Uh, if I put that the z's, if I put that each one of these are, are of one z1, and so on, then the y that I get would be c1 plus c2 plus c3, and then C1, Z1 plus C3, Z3, which is projectively the same as 1, and C1, Z1 plus C3, Z3 over the sum. So you don't have to do these manual, uh, you don't have to do these manual uh, uh, ways of making things have the right units and so on um, by hand. Everything is just taken care of by the, by the projectivization. Uh, I'll give you a, a final example that you can play with just as an exercise. Here we talked about lines and points. What is a conic? Okay. Let's say I'm on a plane, and what is a conic? Well, all the points on the conic are satisfied, something that satisfies a quadratic equation. So all the points on the conic satisfy an equation like cij, zi, zj is equal to zero. Okay, so, so what specifies a conic is a two by two symmetric matrix. Sorry, it's a, it's a three by three. Uh, 
symmetric matrix C. So um, a little exercise for you to convince yourself. It's very simple. Um, let, let's say you have a conic and you have a point on the conic. Let's say this point x is on the conic. What is the line which is tangent to that point? And now this is starting to become much more of a pain in the ass in the usual way of doing high school geometry. Okay? But, well, what is it from this point of view? There's a point on a conic, and from it, I have to get a line, right? So uh, I, have to, uh, I have to take something, I have to take my data as Cij, and then I have this x with a downstairs index j, and out of it, I have to build something with an upstairs index to be a line. Well, there it is. That's the line. That's the line that's tangent to the point on the conic. Okay? And that's the point of playing, uh, uh, when, you, when you think projectively, all you have to do to do geometry problems is just put the objects together and contract the indices the only way you possibly can, and everything always works. Okay? Um, and, um, okay, so that's it for projective geometry 001, and then we'll start with the proper geometry uh, in five minutes. Thanks. Okay. Thank you.